If you've got your copy of God's Word, I invite you to open it to Romans chapter 12. The series that we are in is a profile of Christian service. It is one of the, the great passages of Scripture, Romans chapter 12, and we are devoting an entire series to one single chapter, that chapter, the 12th chapter of Romans, we're in, and, and we're dedicating an entire sermon series to it. And so if, as you are turning there, I invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. I'll read the entire chapter out of the New American Standard Bible this, this morning, beginning verse 1 to the end, verse 21. Paul says this to the church at Rome, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, or he who gives with liberality, He who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May God add his blessing to the hearing and understanding of his word. You may be seated. Today we're going to focus on three verses, verses 3 to 5 of Romans chapter 12, and we'll go to that in just a moment. I don't know how many of you have ever been, have you've ever heard of a book and a, a, a series on marriage called Love and Respect. It's a wonderful book written by Dr. Emerson Egrich, and along with his wife, a very much a, a, a partner, a, a contributor to that to that book. And they not only do they have the book, they have a video series that goes with it. You could watch the video that accompanies the book and you could ask questions. There's workbooks and there's ways to get men and women in marriage, whether it's because of crisis or whether it's just for the purpose of enrichment and, and building up that marriage, whatever it might be, that you'll find them all over these, these seminars and these, these marriage opportunities. And, and love and respect is a great one. We've used it, I've used it before, and it is truly a great resource. But if you've ever watched, if you've ever seen it or been a part of it in any way, even on video or whatever, that Dr. Egrich describes a story early in his presentation. I've seen him do it on video. He's standing up just like this, and he's talking to a group of people. And he's describing the differences between men and women. I'll let women aside, I kind of got you last week with the jewelry. I'm going to set you ladies aside for a minute and look at us men. Dr. Egrich Egrich tells a very funny story or kind of captures it in a very funny way. He says, ladies, to the ladies, he's kind of talking. He said, 
at any point in life and at any stage in life, at any age, there is something about a man that just sees himself always as a bit of an Adonis. (laughs) No matter what the circumstances are, you'll find him wherever it is, kind of tucking in his belt. Any plate glass window that he walks by, he's kind of watching a little bit like this as he goes. And he sees his reflection, kind of notices, thinks maybe a magazine cover is in his future. It doesn't matter how old or where he is or what he, what he really looks like. In his own eyes, every man is a little bit of an Adonis, a little bit of a, uh, a, a specimen that you can only, you, you know, the world has never seen such a, such a figure it's a strange thing among us men, and, and I might be counted among them until I'm in the bathroom getting ready, and my wife comes in and says, uh, Fabio, you might want to get this right here, right? <laughs> it's absolutely the case. I'm sitting there kind of doing one of these numbers in the mirror, and Beverly's like, might clean that out a little bit. But that's just the way men are wired, right? We we always think there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a magazine cover in every one of us. That obviously is far from the truth, isn't it? So very far. Certainly in my case, that is true, that it is far from me. In chapter 12, verses 3 to 5, we're gonna have a little glimpse at what it means to have a, a little misunderstanding of ourselves at times. Paul is not talking about a man's physical, his physique. That is not what he's talking about. But you can allow the sort of the enjoyment of misunderstanding our own level of prowess to this far more a spiritual implication. Today's message is entitled Pride and Prejudice. And no, I've never read the book But both principles to me seem to apply in this passage. Looking together again at Romans chapter 12, this time we begin just simply in verse 3. The first thing that we realize is that there is an enemy of pride. An enemy against pride. An enemy against pride. Look at verse 3 with me. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. There is an enemy of pride. Let me back up just a moment. Pride is one of our greatest struggles in this life. It captures much of our sinful nature. Pride is the manifestation of much of our sinful nature. John, in one of his letters, I believe 1 John, talks about this reality that there really are three essential sins, three essential places where our corrupted heart goes. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That we are constantly in battle with our own pride, our our overestimation of ourselves. Again, taking a little bit of the humorous story of us men when we think we're a little bit more than we really are, but much more deeply in our spirit, much more deeply. We are, at, we are in battle with our pride. It's one of those, those primary pillars of our sinful nature that we have a higher estimation of ourselves than we ever should, than we ever should. But here's what I find so interesting in this is that the enemy of pride, we might think, if I were to just ask you that question, what is the enemy of pride? You might be inclined to say this. Well, humility. Humility is the enemy of pride, right? Not according to verse 3. The enemy of pride is not humility, it is faith. Faith is the enemy of pride. Faith is what does war against our pride. Faith. Now the result, and we'll look at this in a moment, the result of that is 
greater and greater humility. But we don't fight our pride by just saying, let's be more humble. It won't work. Humility is not ammunition, it's the product. The ammunition is faith. Faith is what this says. Notice what he says at the beginning. For the grace, for through the grace given to me. Paul is talking. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you. What is he talking about? He's talking about his commissioning as an apostle. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Paul, you are going to be my witness to the Gentiles. And I'm going to show you, Paul, that you must suffer much for this. But it was a grace given to him, an enabling grace, a commissioning grace that says, Paul, you have persecuted me. I have a task for you. And we are aware of the amazing transformation that happened in Paul's life. And he says, for through the grace, Paul's primary gift, though maybe among others, yes, but his primary gift was apostleship. The the direct messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this case, primarily to the Gentiles. To the the non-Jews who would become the, the church certainly Jewish as well, but the the Gentiles that would overwhelm the church, that was Paul's ministry. And it was grace that was given to him. An enabling and a commissioning grace, all from Christ, all through him, nothing of himself. He was a persecutor. He became a promoter of Jesus Christ by the grace given to him. And he says to them, you ought not to think more highly of yourself. You ought not to think more highly of yourself. He knows pride is one of our greatest struggles. We have a high estimation of ourselves where our sin tells us we are something. And he says, but rather you should have think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. Some of your versions probably say sober-minded. And that is an easy and very tangible picture for us, isn't it? Sober-minded. The difference between being influenced by an alcohol or a drug and that of sobriety. That of being clear at it. I've, I've spoken to people who have addictions and have come through them. And the cloudiness that becomes crystal clear in sobriety. I see it. Well, if that is the case in substance use and abuse that then becomes victory on the other side of it and the clarity that comes, think of it with regard to faith. Faith in what? The first 11 chapters of the entire book, these first chapters, Romans 1 to 11, describe all that God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. The helpless state that we were in in our sin. And he paints the heavens with all of the truth of, his, uh, of what he has done to come in and to rescue us. To bring us into a relationship with him. You understand these verses fo- follow immediately after that truth from Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 11. This is what God, this is what faith looks like believing that God has done all that is required to bring you back into relationship with him pride has no place in that as faith grows pride is squelched it is crushed underneath faith it squashes it if we allow it to do so if we, and what, is, what are we, again, what are we having faith in? That the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ has taken me and has rescued me. And has said, Gordon, you are valuable because my son died for you. He loved you. It's very ironic to think that pride would go down as a sense of being loved goes up. You realize that? A sense of being loved for no reason within me because he just said, I place my love on you. That pride would actually diminish. The more I dwell on the cross, 
The more I dwell, you know, when I was eight years old, I've shared it many times, that's when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I recognized the Spirit of God opened my eyes at that young age, opened my eyes, and I realized that Jesus hung on the cross for me. And I turned my life over as an eight-year-old kid to the Lord Jesus. We, 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 we want to keep in mind always, the gospel did not stop when I was eight years old. The gospel is what I tell myself every single day, now almost 40 years later. It is still what I cry out to. I have long since been saved. I am now every day being saved from my own pride, from my own aggressive attempt to claim something for myself. And the more my faith grows in what Jesus has done for me on the cross and what he continues to do for me through the power of the Spirit, pride is crushed under the weight of truth and my faith. Faith is not, excuse me, humility is not the enemy or the the ammunition against pride. Faith is. Faith is. The allotment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Paul is very clear in the book of Romans that there are levels of growing faith. Believers all, believers among, I'm saying, that even among believers, there are degrees of faith. Jumping over only to chapter 14, he says, consider those with what? Weak faith. Consider those with weak faith. There are degrees of even having salvation faith, that which has now rescued me. There are degrees in which I am being saved, as I said a moment ago. And there are elements of faith. That is why I have to every day go back to the cross. Because I want my faith to grow. And the cross is where it grows. Every time I go back to it, I'm reminded again. And so my isn't it easy, isn't it amazing that the more dependent I am on God, the more mature I am becoming? The more dependent. If you are less dependent of God on God for what He is doing in your life, maturity is at stake. It is at risk. It is, it is in jeopardy. The more dependent you are, independence, throw that away. Cling to Him. Depend upon Him every day. Going to Him crying out to him for his for what he has done applying the truth of what happened to my life today maturity is increasing faith is increasing and pride cannot stand with it it cannot stand with it there is a there's a theologian a scholar from Scotland New Testament scholar named James Denny he says this to himself every man is in a sense the most important person in the world and it, is always, and it always needs much grace to see what other people are and to keep a sense of moral proportion. The first line of that is where I just, I just sit. Every man is, in a sense, the most important person in the world. Jesus, do you notice that when Jesus said, answering the teacher of the law, I referenced it a week or two ago, when he referenced, when, when asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, well, the first and great commandment is that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second one is like it, that you would love your neighbor, how? As yourself. (laughs) I don't need to teach you to love yourself. You love yourself. Can you love your neighbor like you love yourself? That's the question. I don't have to show you how to love yourself. In fact, I'm kind of in a transformation process of helping you not love yourself quite so much. Let me love you. You stop loving you. I'll take that upon me to love you. You love others. How about we do that? How about that exchange? You let me love you. You love others. This is what we find This is what we realize. Every man feels a sense of his own greatest value. And faith in the cross and faith in what Jesus is doing in us even today is the war against pride. 
Well, the second thing that we learn through this is that the product, we learn what the product of faith really is, and that is humility. The product of faith is humility. We don't muster up humility. We believe what God says is true, and through that, He humbles the heart. We realize what truth is. We realize that we could not do anything for ourselves. That we still today, were it not for the Spirit of God, could not do anything for ourselves. And so humility begins to seed in our heart. And by the power of the Spirit, that humility grows and grows. And interestingly enough, we feel less and less humble as we are growing more and more humble. We see where we have more corners, dark cobwebs that need to be rooted out because humility has not yet been achieved fully. But it it takes that process of believing what God has said is true, meditating upon His Word, praying deeply with Him daily to ask Him to expose the areas of pride that still exist. And by faith, He roots it out. And He brings humility as a product in Paul has in his letter to say the, se- the second letter to the Corinthians that we have in verse in chapter 10 verses 12 then 17 and 18 look at this verse 12 i want to look at it kind of for a moment for we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves they are without understanding <laughs> don't you love the rhythm and the repetition When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, you see the folly? You see the folly of it all? I'm measuring myself according to myself. (laughs) And I'm measuring, I'm comparing myself according to myself. You can't do that. You can't accomplish anything comparing yourself to yourself. You're dead in the water. Compare yourself to something that is worth comparing to. And who is that? Jesus himself. And as soon as you have reached him, let me know. And I'll do the same for you. But notice what he says. But he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he, who, but he whom the Lord commends. We know that Jesus has a ministry of intercession for each of us, doesn't he? Those of us who are his his brothers and sisters, who are children of his father. He is working every day to intercede for us before his father. And what is he saying to his father? What is he commending to his father? Father, love them because they are good people. Love him, will you, Father? Because they are good deep down. Their heart is essentially in the right place. Their motives are relatively pure. God, would you forgive them? Because they're kind of good. Is that how he commends us to his Father? What Jesus says when he intercedes to his Father on our behalf, he says, Father, forgive them and look upon them as covered in my blood. See them through my sacrifice. And God says, I will. I do. I see them through you, my son. I see them through you, and for that reason, I forgive them. And I restore them. And I commend them. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, Peter takes up a similar thought. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. Where are we in that? (laughs) Where do you find us? We are nothing more than instruments. Instruments that, that have no noise what to produce if it wasn't something being sent through us. The utterances of God... The service given by the strength that He supplies. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. 
to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The product of faith is humility. It is recognizing, God, I am just simply an instrument. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus describes the the silliness of a servant who comes out of the field and sits down at the table of his master and says to the master, serve me. How silly is that? But no, the servant comes in and immediately girds himself up and begins to serve the master the dinner. And when asked of it, he says, I only do that that I ought to do. I am a humble servant. You know how you know of yourself? And and only do this test on you. Don't do it on someone else. Do it on you. Kind of proverbial You know when someone is a truly humble servant when they are treated like one joyfully. You know someone is a humble servant when they are in fact treated as a servant and do so humbly. Don't you know that experience when you have served, when you have done something, and you are kind of sadly treated like that? I'm not encouraging that at all, but it is a reality, isn't it? That we sometimes serve, and at the end of the day, we are treated like someone who is nothing more than a servant. And here's the litmus test. Are you okay with that? Are you all right with that? Are you all right being viewed as a servant and nothing really more? That's what this passage is asking. That's what this passage is asking. And so we find the evidence, the evidence of humble service. Verses 4 and 5. For just as we are many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. This is a very rich analogy that we have found not only here, but in other places that Paul describes the body of Christ as it connects with the body of any human being that we know so well our human body, and how it works in, in tandem. All of the different parts work together. We know this. And the evidence of humility is these two verses. That we recognize that we are, we are an instrument, and we have a function, and that function is God-given. That function is God-given. He says, Gordon... I have this for you. All of the rest of you, I have this for you. This is special for you. I want to use you in a unique way. I want you to take these gifts, and we'll look at them next week, that we're going to look at these gifts that he has given us and ask yourself, how comfortable are you with the gift he has given you or gifts? Are you looking across the aisle? Are you looking next to you and asking yourself, I really like his or her gift. They're more important than me. I wish I had theirs. They're not as important as me. I, wish, I bet they wish they had mine. Celebrating. Celebrating that God would use any of us at all. That he would use any. God, you want to make me the little toe? I love it. I love it. I have the hardest nail to clip. People will remember me. No. The little toe. Would you be happy being a little toe? Would you be happy being whatever it is that God asked you to be? Would you just blow your mind because he would say, I want to use you at all? That I want to use you at all. You know, there's a great story when Jesus is... After his resurrection, he comes back and he visits what Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians 15. He says that he, he probably saw as many as 500, right? But, but most of his time, as you would expect, seemed to have been spent with the disciples to encourage them and to remind them and to, to give them, ultimately, to anticipate that they will be spirit-filled 
and they will be on a mission from that day forward. But there's this one story in John chapter 21 of where they're walking along a beach. They're walking along a beach, and, and Jesus is yet again building into these men who are going to be his messengers from this point forward. He's building into them, he's loving them every step of the way. You know what he says to Peter? He says, Peter, I've got a plan for you. There's probably suffering involved in that plan, but I have a plan for you. After his failures, after his denial, after that brokenness that Peter felt when he did deny his Savior, all of that, and he's in the process of restoring Peter back up. And he says, Peter, I have a plan for you. It's a good chance it's going to involve some suffering. Peter looks, I can imagine, looks at Jesus, kind of looks over here at John. He's like, well, well what about him? What are, you, what are you going to do with him? And Jesus says, Peter, if I want him to remain, is that any concern of yours? I have something for you. Don't worry about him. I am commissioning you in this task. And Peter had, if you might say it, the greatest responsibility that anyone could have outside of Jesus himself. He was the founder of the church. And he was worried about what John was doing. Imagine if he dwelled there. We, we are, it's obvious that he didn't. And praise the Lord for it. Imagine if he dwelled in not being John. But no, he dwelled with the help of the Holy Spirit in being Peter. That's what he decided. I will be Peter. And whatever you ask of me, I will do it. And I will do it with enthusiasm. I kind of begin to wrap up with this statement on the subject of humility, I give you this. Humility shows itself through a spirit of oneness and cooperation and an enthusiasm for whatever God asks me to serve Him by His grace. Whatever way God asks me to serve Him by His grace. I am not worried about what He is asking of anyone else. I'm worried about what He's asking of me. That's what I'm spending my time on. God, what are you asking of me? That's, that's what I want to know. And that is the picture of humble servant. And I, am, I struggle with it no different than any of you. No different than any of you. I struggle with it. Wondering if, God, I'd rather have something else. I'd, I'd rather do something else. I'd rather be used in another way. The humility that requires, that, that bases our ability to serve one. And they are members individually, not only a member of Christ, member in the body of Christ, uh, one body in Christ, but individually members one of another. That is so important. I use this analogy a lot. Uh, I, use it, I, I use it in different ministry contexts, but there's the difference between the wheel and the spider web. The wheel and the spider web. See, all of us are willing to be a wheel a little bit more so, because what does it mean? We have a hub. Who is that? The Lord Jesus. And we're all spokes of that wheel, right? And we are tapped firmly in to Jesus. And we're kind of settled on that. What if you were to start thinking about the body of Christ more like a spider web? Connected, intricate, dependent, one strand to another. Not do, we don't get to just be connected to Jesus, we are asked to be connected to each other. And that is the humility of service. Serving one another. Serving out of that humility. The enthusiasm, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you before. Enthusiasm is from the Greek word combination, en theos. Enthusiasm. En theos. What does that mean? I am so tapped into God. Theos, that my life is a reflection of that. That's where the word comes from. Can you imagine being so tapped into him that I am enthused to do whatever he asked me to do and I'm not worried about what he is asking of anyone else to do? I finish with this. Robin and I had no planning on this whatsoever. I know, imagine me not planning anything. 
we had no plan for this, that I chose to go through Romans 12 at this time during the, the summer, and we have VBS. Everything that you see behind me and everything that you have seen throughout the building, if you've been anywhere through it, coming in the hallway right here in the middle, out in the, out in the foyer, or down the children's hallways, I didn't have diddly squat to do with any of that. You know, a lot of the people that came out during the week, there were several ladies, I think, that were in and out of this building during the week, getting it ready gradually, and then last, yesterday was this massive party that did this and other things. I had nothing to do with it. Nothing. And I'm sure that there are a lot of, um, I'm sure that there are a lot of men and women who, if given the request or the task of coming up here and flapping their gums, as I did today, would run for the hills. Would run for the hills, okay? I, I'm sure that is, for many, not all, but many, the case. No thank you. What is behind me is more of a true picture of this passage than I could possibly add of my own doing. And I was thinking with Rob, and I'm like, and she was one really that kind of initiated the conversation, isn't this amazing that you are doing this and that we are doing this? Isn't this amazing? What an unbelievable picture of Romans chapter 12, especially verses 1 through what will be 8 as of next week. Gifts on display. And I know that the vast majority, hopefully all of the people that were here yesterday and through the last week, they want no earthly credit because, man, they are waiting for Jesus to thank them for giving their life away, even for just a little bit, for the welfare of kids who might hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I can't say it better than this does. I can't, I can't even begin to capture it the way that this does. But it, it is the truth nonetheless that this is a picture. What is going to happen all week long is a picture of Romans chapter 12. I am just excited to be a finger. I'm excited that, God, you would want to make me an eye or a spleen or a small intestine. I'm just thrilled that you want to use me at all. And I'm thrilled that you're using my brother or my sister in his or her way. I'm thrilled that we get to do this together. We get to do it together. I'd like to ask something. I promise I've talked it over with the Lord. And he says this is okay. All right? That you, that... He will work on your heart if you're here um, that there is still an opportunity for eternal reward for this. But I'm going to ask you nonetheless, if you have had anything to do with what has gone on here this week in preparation for next week and or if you are here next week for what is going to happen, would you please stand? Please. It's okay. It is okay. You can be seated. And there are more that are not here now, but will be. There are more that have been here this week, but are maybe not here at this hour right now. That is the picture. And my prayer for you all, and I said it, was that you would allow the Spirit of God to protect your heart from ever thinking that it was about you, because it wasn't. And you know that. And I know that you know that which is the only reason why I would try and bring any thankfulness to you in this life, because I know your desire is, I want to do it for the Lord. I want to do it for Him. And you keep praying that last week and into next week, you who have served us all. Pray it through from this week till next, that you would recognize, you would recognize, I ought not to think more of myself. I am a humble servant. And the faith, the allotted faith that God has given me, I will serve. I will serve with enthusiasm, excitement, that I even get to be used at all. I'd like to pray for those adults, and, I will, and just voice it. That's all I'm going to do is voice it in my prayer as we close. And for what will happen here this week.
with the children, the dozens and dozens, who knows how many by tomorrow night will end up being registered. It's always a mad rush, and praise God for it, because that's every heart that might show up is ordained by God. And as I close, we will be dismissed at the conclusion. Thank you for those of you who are investing this week, last week. Would you pray with me? God, we are excited that Romans 12 is being lived out right before us. It is every day, but we get a kind of a special glimpse into it this week, last week and this week. Yesterday, I can't even, can't even picture how the, the, the body of Christ needed to come together to do something that no one person could do alone. Nobody could do alone. We, we couldn't have accomplished it by ourselves, but together, because of the Spirit of God dwelling among us and working through us, you will accomplish what you want to accomplish. Lord, we thank you for this. I thank you for the men and women who have, up to this point and will throughout next week, dedicate their heart and their life to the, the hopes of seeing even one, two, or 50 hearts of children come to know the Lord Jesus and know him for the rest of their lives. Lord, would you, would you just let us be joyful in our service? Help us to not think that this is us, that this is you working through us. And by faith, pride is crushed and humility grows. I pray for all that will happen this week. Music, technical things, teachers, preparation, crafts, games, no, hurt, no one hurt. But Lord, that your name, the name of your son, be proclaimed. We love you, and Lord, may that be true of us, whether we're part of EBS or not, but specifically that, we just pray that that is what flows through us this week. All, any of us, wherever we are. I am only a humble servant. I'm only doing that which I ought to do. Bless us as we go, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.